Good evening, welcome. My name is Miriam Heyer. I'm the Senior Director for External Affairs here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Miriam Schultz is a PhD candidate in Yiddish Studies at Columbia University, and she's the Harriman PepsiCo Fellow for 2018 and 2019. She completed her BA in Judaic Studies, followed by an MA in Modern Judaism and Holocaust Studies at, in Berlin. For her monograph, Miriam was awarded both the Scientific Award of the Polish Ambassador in Germany and the Spilman, Ho Hosenfeld Spillman Memorial Award in January 2017. In 2017, she co-organized the first summer university for Yiddish language and literature ever to take place in Berlin, together with, and you're going to have to help me with this French pronunciation, uh, Maison de la Culture Yiddish. Sounds better when she says it. <laughs> and the Institute for Eastern European Studies of her alma mater. Without further ado, here's Miriam. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you so much for coming and of course thank you so much to Miriam Haya and um, the Museum of Jewish Heritage for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm really sorry I still need manuscript when I speak in front of many people, so apologies in advance. But um, yeah, it's, it's a benefit for all of us, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so today I will talk about the study that Miriam just talked about um, of a previously unknown source of Jewish Holocaust documentation, namely um, Wiener Library's document section 532, or the archive of the Komitee zu Sammeln Materialen wegen Jiddischen Hoben in Polen 1939 in English, the Committee to Collect Materials about the Destruction of Polish Jewry um, 1939. So the backstory of my discovery, as it were, is unfortunately far from spectacular. Um, well, at least if you have the image of the unearthing of, the, of Ringelblum's Warsaw Ghetto archive in, in your head, um, which is of course the most well-known documentation effort um, of Jewish life and destruction in the wake of Nazi rule and persecution in Eastern Europe, thanks to, amongst others, Professor Kassov's work on it. Um, it was in 2012 when I worked as an intern at the Wiener Library in London and a very bored intern at that. So up until this one day in December 2012 when Howard Falkson, the library's archivist, asked me to have a look at certain materials in Yiddish, I had felt more like a superintendent of the building. Um, so to change light bulbs in places that no no one ever dared to go to before had been one of my main field of responsibility. But then there was this one day when Howard realized that I could um, somehow be of other use as well, namely to, to decipher an abundance of material in Yiddish that no one in the library had looked at before either. Um, and at, um, at the time I was the only one at the institute, the Wiener Library, who could read Hebrew, and Yiddish, so Howard approached me with a few microfilms and gave me the task to inform him about its content. Um, and to this day, I still remember the feeling of astonishment and excitement and humbleness also when I first skimmed through the pages and how stunned I was when I realized it, its um, significance. So, so I started to piece together the puzzle behind the material I found, and it became clear that um, it was the archive of the Committee to Collect Materials about the Destruction of Polish Jewry, 1939, or as I came to call it, the Vilnius Committee. So on this picture you see um, members, presumably members of this committee, um, and I get back to that later on. So this committee had been the very first known Jewish civil resistance group in Eastern Europe, who dedicated itself to the documentation of the Holocaust between November 1939 and June 1941. It was founded in November 1939 by Polish Jewish um, refugee journalists and writers in the safe haven of Vilnius, in still independent Lithuania, who managed to escape there from recently occupied Warsaw and Poland in general. 
So in the coming 40 minutes or so, I will present my findings regarding this document section 532 and its creators. I will be sharing with you background information uh, about the committee's creation, activities and goals in order to elucidate its significance for, of this collective for the history of Jewish resistance to Nazi persecution. But I would also like to think beyond the history of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust or even Jewish history proper. Let's try and place the Vilnius Committee also in the very current history of forced migration. To put it bluntly, the Vilnius Committee's um, documentation that is the beginning of Holocaust historiography and scholarship was a refugee enterprise through and through. One where both the forced migration itself as well as the documentation efforts in response to it are a form of resistance to Nazi persecution. One where the production of counter knowledge to Nazi hegemony is tied to the performance of a counter geography by Jewish ref refugees who, through ever changing routes, escaped and resisted the military forces that mapped the early Second World War in Poland. So, with this framework in mind, I will introduce you to an educational project that I launched this year together with my team in Berlin, which tries to understand refugeedom in the long durée. With the project We Refugees, Transnational Archive Research and Education Center on Refugees, we want to bring into dialogue narratives of refugeedom then, that is, during the Holocaust and now in the, 90, um, in the 2010s. Okay, so in January 1943, political theorist Tana Arendt wrote the article We Refugees for the New York Journal Menorah. Arendt was herself a German Jewish refugee from Nazi persecution who managed to um, escape to New York City from France uh, via Spain and Portugal on the very route on which Walter Benjamin, um, Walter Benjamin, why do I say it in English, um, <laughs> would die sev several months later. So in her article, We Refugees, she meditates on the changed meaning of the term refugee itself and the political self-conception of Jewish refugees in these dire times. So she says, no, ah. okay. A refugee used to be a person driven to seek refuge because of some act committed or some political opinion held. Well, it is true we have had to seek refuge, but we committed no acts and most of us never dreamt of having any radical political opinion. Now refugees are those of us who have been so unfortunate as to arrive in a new country without means and have to be helped by refugee committees. We lost our home, we lost our occupation, we lost our language. Nevertheless, as soon as we were saved, we started a new lives and tried to follow as closely as possible all the good advice our saviors passed on to us. We were told to forget and we forgot quicker than anybody ever could imagine. In the course of her essay, Aaron calls on Jewish refugees to abstain from any further efforts to assimilate, since assimilation is ultimately always futile. Instead, they shall develop a new self-assurance and become politically active for their very own sake, since those few refugees who insist upon telling the truth, even to the point of indecency, Arendt is convinced, get in exchange for their unpopularity one priceless advantage. History is no longer a closed book to them, and politics is no longer a pr the privilege of Gentiles. Refugees driven from country to country represent the vanguard of their people if they keep their identity. In 1943, Arendt couldn't have known that her call for political action stemming from Jewish self-assurance had already been put into action by a clandestine group of Polish Jewish refugees in Vilnius since November 1939. It was the early months of the Second World War when this refugee vanguard had emerged. A refugee that had to be helped by refugee committees, yes, but that having been politically active already before the war, didn't think of assimilation and abandonment of one's language, Yiddish, albeit being exiled from Poland. And above all, this refugee didn't think of forgetting. So with the German attack on Poland on September 1st, 1939, hundreds of thousands of Poles, Jewish or not, tried to escape forces east, German forces eastward. Early on, a Polish defeat was expected, and when the Polish government announced um, its retreat from Warsaw in a radio broadcast on September 6, 
a Polish exodus and panic moving eastward unfolded. Already on September 5th, the Polish government had evacuated by train Polish journalists representing both Polish and Polish Jewish newspapers. Um, sorry. Um, in order for them to build up the press in the eastern territories when Warsaw was going to be lost to the enemy. The train with the journalist left Warsaw in the night of September 5th with an unknown destination somewhere in the east. Little did they know, of course, about the coming Soviet invasion on September 17th. And after a tumultuous train ride of over a month, the journalist train arrived in none other than Lithuania's finally regained capital, Vilnius, on October 10th, 1939. On board were 29 Polish Jewish journalists in service of all Polish Jewish newspapers, which each was affiliated with a different kind of a Jewish polit political movement of the time, um, Folkist, Bundist, Zionist, you name it. And those 29 constituted the core of what would become the Vilnius Committee. The Polish Jewish journalists weren't the only ones, though, that arrived in Vilnius as refugees. Indeed, Lithuania was swamped with a refugee crisis, with approximately 14,000 Jewish refugees and at least as many non-Jewish refugees from Poland. Ironically, Vilnius, as we probably all know, was home to a century-old, well-established um, Jewish cultural infrastructure. And it was Vilnius, the mythologized Jerusalem de Lite, that suddenly in war-torn Eastern Europe housed an unprecedented concentration of Polish Jewish intelligentsia. But while the Polish Jewish newcomers hoped for a modest continuation of the pre-war cultural life um, of Warsaw in Vilnius, the neutral Lithuanian state faced a humanitarian crisis due to the large numbers of refugees who had managed to escape to the only safe haven left in Eastern Europe. Um, so international refugee committees stepped in and in the case of Jewish refugees, it was primarily the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, an American Jewish help agency, as we probably also all know, that had been formed during the First World War and helped Jews in need um, in every part of the world ever since. And the Joint tried to help all Jews stranded in Vilnius, but its representatives, Moses Beckelmann and Yitzhak Gitterman, sketched a special job creation scheme for the now approximately 60 Polish Jewish journalists and writers who temporarily dwelt in the Lithuanian capital. The joint not only housed the journalists together in a hospital in Zadova Street 9, but also supported them financially to realize a special documentation project of the destruction of Polish Jewry by Nazi Germany. On the provision of this financial and spiritual platform by the joint, the Committee, the Vilnius Committee, was clandest clandestinely founded by Neuer Prilutsky in November of that same year. So that's <coughs> Neuer Prilutsky. Um, he was a Yiddish scholar of folklore and philology, a journalist and founding editor of the Yiddish newspaper Der Moment, one of the two most important Yiddish newspapers in interwar Poland. Additionally, he was a political leader who, together with Simon Dubnov, had founded the Jewish Folks Party, People's Party, fighting for Jewish national and cultural autonomy in Poland. All of this anticipated his leading role within the Vilnius Committee and also predetermined the intrinsic political character of the committee's endeavor. Prilutsky was able to convince those 60 other, or 59 if we're precise, other Jewish refugee journalists and writers from Poland, as well as local intellectuals, of the significance of his documentation project. Furthermore, and not surprisingly, documents in the joint archive in New York suggest that the committee also cooperated with the YIVO, um, the most important research institution of Eastern European Jewry since 1925, at the time still having a branch also in Vilnius. <clears throat> so according to a letter held in the archive, the committee, committee was convinced that the crimes, and I quote, the, the crimes committed against hundreds of thousands of Jews are unprecedented 
and strove to have detailed evidence, like in a legal inquest, reports of an extreme accuracy, documents with figures and names thoroughly verified, which were to function as a weapon in the fight against the oppressors and persecutors, and to be used as a foundation of the demands of the Jewish nation at the future peace conference. To achieve this, their plan was as follows. And this is also from the same letter. First, to fix in chronological order what has happened to Polish Jewry since the outbreak of the war up to the present moment. Second, to fix the number of victims and the material losses among the Jewish population in the Jewish centers in Poland for the whole period of time. Third, to draw up thoroughly checked lists of Jews killed during the bombardments and fires or tortured to death by the enemies. Fourth, to fix the details and the results of mass deportations of Jews ordered by the enemies in a number of towns. Five, to examine the further fate of expulsed Jews. Six, to get information about the sufferings of Jews in concentration camps. And seven, to describe the policy of violence carried on by the Germans with respect to Jews in the occupied territories. And I might remind you that this was November 1939 when this was drawn up. So as I mentioned before, there, there was one important source of information the committee could count on. Those 14,000 Jewish refugees who were stuck in Vilnius and could talk about their experiences. <clears throat> According to the aforementioned letter, the committee members interviewed several refugees every day between 1939 and March 1940. Um, November 1939 and March 1940. Every refugee was deliberately chosen from the available refugee lists according to his or her hometown and subsequently invited to the office. There he or she gave testimony about events in the hometown, in the hometowns, or about experiences on the flight to Vilnius. A committee member would draw up a report, read it back to the refugee, who would then affirm its correctness. Then the report would be checked against other refugee reports from the same locality. So the immediacy of the committee's documentation and the perceived national mission of the post-war restitution is unique. Similarly, the professionalism with which the interviews were conducted and reports were analyzed is striking but maybe not surprising. Indeed, their strategies of documentation didn't emerge ex nihilo, but from a long-standing Jewish archival impulse that Laura Jokush and others have provided important studies about. And this very impulse had resulted in large-scale documentation um, projects in the wake of um, pogroms um, long before the Holocaust. Additionally, having been journalists before the war, um, the committee members were well aware that processing and encoding Storage and retrieval of memory is inevitably fragile, selective, emotional, and ideologically shaped. So for the sake of creating an objective documentation, they strove to collect as many reports as possible from all stratas of um, Polish Jewry and subsequently critically assess the sources by their survivor witnesses. But they realized as well that solid documentation cannot merely be based on victim, victim sources. Those needed to be supplemented with perpetrator ones too, which the committee eagerly tried to collect as well. So in doing so, they did pioneering work. Already in 1939, they operated in accordance with metho methodologies that only entered the academic field of Holocaust studies in the 1980s and 1990s, the so-called integrative met method combining both perpetrator and victim sources. And thanks to their work, we have now roughly 1,000 typewritten refugee reports in Yiddish. On the basis of these testimonies, short reports about the situation of Jewish centers in Poland during wartime 1939, as well as six bulletins, were compiled by the committee. Together, this corpus con conveys a plethora of unmitigated Jewish memories from the so-called incubation phase of the Holocaust, and is consequently a unique and invaluable source for the study of the Holocaust and the writing of its historiography. These memory memories sprouted in a time when the wheel of history 
was moving towards the still unknown catastrophe and of a kind of raw immediacy, free of the backshadowing tendencies of much of later Holocaust testimony and scholarship. Um, additionally, and here we come to the second part of my presentation, this archive holds an abundance of yet to be excavated refugee data for the building of a digital historiography of refugeedom and for the capturing of human mobility in Holocaust history and history proper. Um, so my EU-funded project, We Refugees Transnational Archive Research and Education Center on Refugees, is dedicated to the creation of a multilingual digital documentation and learning tool with a focus on refugeedom as experienced from below and on the microcosm of um, specific cities as loci of arrival, for example, Vilnius. In, the, in this case. So in the wake of the so-called refugee crisis of the 2010s, all over Europe and also in America, um, echoes of the past were seemingly ubiquitous with the Holocaust as an especially instinctive point of reference. Um, through the long durée approach and with a nod to Arendt, of course, we refugees aims to tease out commonalities and set limits of comparability between the then, that is, the experiences of Jews fleeing Nazism before and during the Second World War, and now, namely experiences of those who are forced to migrate from all parts of the world. And apart from a document archive of historical and current sources, the project will provide an open access web-based learning platform centering around an interactive um, world map enriched with eager documents, timelines, historical and present day background information and short films spotlighting the flight of individuals and their arrival in certain cities. So we really put the individuality of the migrant center stage. And for 2019, the project will be focusing on Vilnius as a city of arrival for Jewish um, refugees from German and Soviet-occupied Poland in 1939-1940 um, and juxtapose it to Palermo as the exemplary sanctuary city of today. <clears throat> so the question is, what are the potentials of the Vilnius Corpus for thinking about refugeedom in the long durée, and what is the potential for capturing forced migration of Jews for an educational project in digital humanities? First, the material um, opens a window into individual experiences and Möglichkeitsräume, so spaces of opportunity of all strata of Polish Jewry, both in the face of the still incipient German occupation and concomitant first waves of um, violence. Second, it provides insight into biographical and mi migratory trajectories and a nascent layer of um, making sense of one's own um, still very fresh traumatic experiences. And I will provide two examples of this later. <clears throat> and last but not least, the bulletins, um, so those neatly manufactured collages by the committee about a certain aspect of German occupation and persecution of Polish Jewry, they shed light on interpretations of the unfolding events by the Polish Jewish intelligentsia in Vilnius. This is a topic I cannot touch today, but we can talk about it in the discussion also. Um, so when I was contemplating about the insights digital humanities can offer the study of this corpus and about humane approaches of visualizations away from just straight lines and arrows. I stumbled across the work of conceptual artist Bouchra Khalili during a visit of um, Jeux de Pomme in Paris, or oh, Paris, sorry. Um, <clears throat> It was the mapping journey project that deeply touched and inspired, inspired me. This work presents maps of um, the world to show the itinerary uh, of one particular forced migration de uh, dictated by contingency, money, and decision making in extremis. Indeed, the map is all we see. On this surface is written, drawn, and reenacted upon a counter geography. 
<coughs> by both inscribing the erratic journey of a person forced to migrate, migrate and performing the journey through narration. It is the hand and voice that the viewer gets to know of the migrant, as well as the details of his or her life pre, post, but primarily during the journey, of course. A journey that marks not only the map we see, but one that became formative um, of the survivor's identity. But as Khalili herself reminded us, it misses the real point to reduce the mapping journey project to a work about migrations. It is de facto work about resisting the arbitrariness of power. Not only does it highlight the often overlooked fact, whether intentionally or not, that those we re and I quote, that those we reduce to the status of migrants as political subjects who do not lack initiative or talent, having determinedly maneuvered across dangerous terrain and hostile encounters to speak with Dan Stone here. What the protagonists are also truly testifying to is his survival and ongoing struggle in the future. It is striking, I think, how much this conceptual an analysis of the Mapping Journey project can, can be applied to the refugee bio biographies held in the archive of the Vilnius Committee. And also how much Khalili's project, its film language and meaning can serve as a sort of blueprint for the visualization of um, the Vilnius corpus through digi digital humanities. A sort of factual cartography of counter geography combined with situated knowledge um, of Nazi persecution from below, acts of Jewish resistance to persecution and to the migration regime, laden with the hope for a Jewish future in Eastern Europe. Apart from its blatant beauty, and I quote, it is also a form of unity to speak with Omar Berada. That is not an author authoritarian narrative. It preserves individualities and at the same time acknowledges the precariousness of community as a constellation of tenuous strands." End quote. Applied to the Vilnius um, Corpus our, on our digital platform, the different steps of the individual journey will be commented and historically contextualized with the help of archival material, photographs, and digital tools. The obvious difference between Khalili's work and a similar one ded dedicated to Polish Jewish refugees in 1939 to Vilnius would be the absence of the hands and voices of the survivor refugees themselves. Not only were the interviews in 1939 mostly given anom anonymously, it is unclear whether the respective refugee survived the coming um, war years and whether he or still lives today, which is unfortunately rather doubtful, of course. So <clears throat> more or less randomly, I chose two refugee testimonies, um, one from a Jewish woman and one from a Jewish man, as examples for the data potential of the Vilnius Corpus. So let me start with protocol 79 from December um, 21st, 1939. This is the interview by Chaim Leib. He's a, he was a 21-year-old manufacturer in the town of Pabianice. Sorry for my Polish, I cannot speak Polish. About 10 kilometers so southwest of Wood. Um, so, Chaim Leib is part of the age group and gender most represented actually in the Vilnius archive, just for background information. Okay, this is his itinerary. He left uh, Pabianice on foot in the night of September 5th, 1939, like most other non-Jewish and Jewish inhabitants of the city, fleeing both from the invading German troops and bombardments. After a journey of three days, he arrived in Warsaw on September 8th, having passed through Wuch, where he expected to meet relatives that had, however, also already left, then through Strykov, Glovno, through the burning and abandoned village of Lovic, uh, Zoschatschet, and Gorcic. From Gorcic, a Polish soldier um, took Chaim Leib to Warsaw, where he stayed until September 17th, helping to build barricades for the city's defense. 
Through connections to the Bund, he managed to stay in a building um, of the Jewish community, which was tran transformed into a shelter for refugees from Western Poland. And on September 16th, rumors started to spread and were corroborated by an official notice that Wuch and surrounding areas um, were retaken by the Polish army and ready for the displaced population to return. Chaim Leib, together with roughly eight other Jews from Pabianice and several more from Wuch, as well as a big group of non-Jews, tried to make their way back through the front lines to their respective hometowns. Armed with official passage and passage permissions, bombarded by German planes, helped by Polish forces and escaping German ones, experiences experiencing anti-Semitism, persecution, and forced labor. Chaim Leib passed through Jolibosch, Sotacet, Bolimov, was imprisoned in a forced labor camp in Lovich, but was able to escape to Wuch, passing through Glovno and Strykiv, and finally arriving in Pabianice after eight days on September 24th. He stayed there until November 23rd, after learning about the persecution of the city's Jewish population uh, in the time he was away and having witnessed the steady implementation of anti-Jewish decrees himself, Chaim Leib decided to leave again. On November 23rd, he took the tram to Wuch, then moved on to Strykov, where he took off the Yellow Star and bought a train ticket to Warsaw over Lovic. From Warsaw, he took a train to Malkin together with 5,000 other Jews who tried to escape um, to the Soviet border. At Malkin, all Jews were searched through and money and valuables were robbed before being forced over the border to the Soviets. The Soviets, however, didn't permit border crossing either. Without going into detail, Chaim Leib did manage to cross the border in the end, as we know, because he gives this interview. He escaped to Bialystok and moved on to Vilnius. Um, the next example would be protoc protocol number 171. The interview took place in Vilnius on February 8, 1940, with a Jewish female landlord identified with the initials Peiresz from the northeastern Polish city of Suwaki, close to the Lithuanian border. She starts to relate that on October 4th or 5th, 1939, Russian troops left Suwaki after ceremonially transferring the city to the head of the German army on the central square. The town was named, renamed Zudaun and incorporated directly into the German Reich's East Prussia. The first days of German occupation, she, she says, everything remained rather calm, except for several anti-Jewish decrees and the looting of Jewish homes and shops among them the shop of the interviewee. In December 1939, a cryptic decree was published ordering the Jewish population to get ready and take with them food for three days. Nobody knew what were to happen, but our interviewee on her way to um, grocery shop <coughs> coincidentally witnessed from afar how Jews of all ages were gathered, um, maltreated, humiliated, and threatened with the deportation to the Lublin reservation. In a split second, she decided to turn around, go back home to her children in order to get ready to run off. With the help of a non-Jewish neighbor who warned her of her approaching as Esmen, she, together with her children, escaped through the back door down to the basement where they hid while the Jewish population of the city um, was rounded up for deportation and while Jewish property was completely looted. At three at night, a Christian neighbor gave her the sign to run away with her children. They arrived in a village four kilometers away from Suwaki, where they stayed for two days. From there, they got a ride to the village Mandani at the Lithuanian border. Then, in the so-called no man's land, 3,000 others, um, other Jews were deported from, no. So, this was the so-called no man's land. From this place, 3,000 Jews were deported from, um, to the Lublin reservation, um, while, while a small number of 10 ran over the Soviet side. And roughly 50 Suwaki Jews head out for three weeks 
until our interviewee and her children were arrested by the Germans and brought back to Suwaki in order to deport her also to the Lublin reservation. She, however, managed to bribe the Germans, so much so that she and her daughter, I don't know what happened to the second child, were brought back to the Lithuanian border, this time being able to cross over to journey on to Calvarie and then to Vilnius. So while both interviewees described um, their fate as pure luck, the responses to Nazi persecution reveal a high degree of initiative, attentiveness, foresight, negotiation skills, and agency, as well as the existence of a network. It reveals how Jewish resistance lurked in everyday routine, as well as in the act of journeying away, and how Jewish survival also depended on small gestures of help in form of food, information, and transport from Poles. So in conclusion, I believe that the Vilnius Corpus is truly unique, not only because it was the very first such, such um, Jewish documentation activity in Eastern Europe. Even Emanuel Ringelblum in his um, ghetto diary noted his other utter respect and also the envy he felt towards the Vilnius Committee um, and it's a, a working condition in Vilnius, which was of course much freer. They were not in a ghetto. They were not working in a ghetto. Um, we have here also a, a unique abundance of information from below about flight trajectories and local implementation of persecution. And in the framework of my project, We Refugees, this information will be enriched with historical information on the specific localities, both before and during the war, with timelines, photographies, uh, information on specific migration regimes, etc., where the eager documents fall short. And finally, for all those who want to learn German, there's this amazing book about the Vilnius Committee written by me called Der Beginn des Untergangs. And yeah, feel free to buy it, of course. Thank you so much. Questions? Yeah. It is, yes. Um, if you go to the website of my publisher, Metropol, to, so Metropol for love, um, to my, the side of my book, there's a link um, where you can find the, the original documents in Yiddish, though. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Lithuania was occupied by the Soviet Union in the spring of 1940, early summer, in the time period between um, October until June 19, October 1939 until June 1940. They had this deal with the Soviets, Soviet stationed um, military forces on Soviet um, territory, but officially um, Lithuania was independent and had to be neutral. So in your in your talk, you use the word refugee and migrant. Mm -hmm. Um, do you use it interchangeably, or in your mind, is there a difference? That is a really good question. Because, and I ask because in today's coverage, or, you know, in the past years, when it was, you know, so intense a few years ago, people referred to these individuals, my recollection, it was more that they were considered migrants, or referred to as migrants. And I just would be curious, from your perspective, do you see a distinction? And if so, what is that? And, and um, I definitely see a distinction between refugees as, and asylum seekers, I think. And um, migrants is, I would say, the overall um, term that you can use for 
all individual migrating somewhere, um, and the nation state that of course has completely failed um, illegalizes acts of migrating anywhere. So I think my migrant is kind of the umbrella term for all of these individuals. Refugees would be the apt term for these individuals um, forced to migrate to Vilnius. Yeah, this is... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I could answer this question. This was also something that I... Yeah, I still cannot quite answer. I believe that they had good contacts to um, also the Polish underground in Vilnius of the time. I also know that um, there were other refugee intellectuals in Vilnius of the time that escaped also from Vilnius and took with them parts of this archive. So it could be that one of those individuals just took a part with them to London on their way somewhere else, or maybe they stayed in London. Or it was the Polish underground that was, of course, also able to get a lot of um, um, documentation from the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, through the um, government in exile in London at the time. So yeah, um, but I can't really. Exactly, yeah, this is another part of the. It's, it is um, really a puzzle because there's still a lot of things missing. I really have only, um, I would say a significant part of this archive is in the um, Wiener Library. Um, I also found, I think, a second part um, in, the, in an archive in Israel, um, which looks like as part of this, um, of this archive. Um, but yeah, it can pop, pop up everywhere, I feel. <laughs> yeah, people just hasn't, haven't really looked for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in this specifically? Uh, um, I guess family history, um, through my Jewish background, I started to study Jewish studies and um, then moved on to studying the Holocaust, which is of something that needs to be studied, I believe. Yeah, this was kind of yeah, the way around. Mm -hmm. your, your family the they were in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the research was done in, in London, actually, at the Wiener Library in London. This is where the archive is held. And then very helpful were also a lot of memoirs written in Yiddish from, from people or refugees that were also in Vilnius for a short period of time. Um, at times even um, journalists that also made their way with this journalist train that I was talking about. So um, there are a lot of pieces still missing, but um, there's quite a good um, documentation. And apparently also in the National Archive in Vilnius itself, there was just unearthed a huge collection um, of material of the YIVO from the years 1939 and 1940, which I'm um, yet to look at. But I presume there's also some things connected to this collective. Sure. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I can imagine, of course, this is all hypothetical. All I can say is that um, the fact that it was written in Yiddish was a major factor for the f fact that it wasn't unearthed yet to the point that I came across it. Um, as I said, I was the only one at the Wiener Library, with a, which is a scandal, of course, that could read Yiddish and Hebrew at the time that I was there. So these, uh, this archive was lying there for 80 years until the time that I looked at it. So I think there's still a, a lot to do, especially with Yiddish sources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, we can go back to, let's go back. Um, I think this one letter that is included in the archive is actually a good um, um, summary of what they were actually aiming to do. So the material may be used as a weapon in the fight against the oppressors and persecutors. It will be used as a foundation of the demands of the Jewish nation in the future peace conference. Um, so yeah, it was absolutely in the spirit of resistance. There was also, as you can tell, still the hope for a future of um, the Jewish nation in Eastern Europe. We have to think that these people, especially Neuer Prilutsky, very much believed in Jewish autonomy in Eastern Europe and definitely also aimed at having um, the Jewish nation part of post-war Poland again. He was not a Zionist. Exactly. Yeah. They were basic, they were actually of all factions. Um, there were also Zionists amongst them, but Neuch Pilutsky, the head of the um, committee. He was definitely not a Zionist and he very much um, emphasized that this is a means to make sure that Jews, Jews have a place in post-war Europe. Mm -hmm. They're definitely still. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's still definitely. This is definitely being done all over the the, the world. Still, um, there's this new movement of recording also Soviet U Jewish um, testimonies by such archives as the Blavatnik archive here in New York, for example. Blavatnik. Um, this is definitely still done. Yeah. Um, vaguely, but n not really, no. <laughs> no. Um, well, this specific work that I did was, yeah, 
I, I was very interested in this very first phase of testimonies. Um, I also think that, that memory studies is very is something very different from what I've been doing with this archive, for example. These were very fresh memories. It was recorded directly after what had happened um, to record someone um, decades later. Um, I believe definitely is more representation of what the person thinks today than what he thought 30 years ago. So I think that's a different, that is definitely different work. Um, super interesting as well, but um, yeah, I'm not really into memory studies. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Of course, the United States Holocaust Museum, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you will. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Arsenal, thank you, to use what we have in our arsenal to make the, the most of this research too. So for instance, I speak Russian, I speak Ukrainian fluently, so I have traveled extensively across the country from village to village and interviewed Holocaust survivors, rescuers, collaborators to understand their perspective. I can do that because I speak these languages. You have amazing strengths that should be used to do what you're doing. It would be a waste of time for all of us to try to grasp the full extent of the entire Holocaust. We have limited time. People are dying. A lot of the people I've interviewed have died. And I think it's very important that all of us do as much as we can using our strengths, whatever our strengths are. Thank you so much. Oops. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how the archive arrived in London and when? Oh, I already answered that question. I don't really, I can't, I don't really know how it got to London. I know that there were contacts to the Polish underground that, of course, had contacts to, in contact to the Polish government in exile, for example. Um, and there were other people that escaped from Lithuania, probably taking parts of the, the archive with them. So there are different theories, but I, yeah. I don't really know. The library itself doesn't have a record? What's that? The library doesn't have a record? No, no, they don't. Was Hermann Krug part of that committee at any point? Um, he writes about them. Um, it's very ambiguous, and I, again, he doesn't go into detail. It seems like he, he knew about the activities. It would make sense if he was part of it. But um, in the material itself, we cannot re there are no names mentioned in the material itself. Um, we have, of course, Crook's diary, as well as some um, articles that he wrote during that time, talking about how amazing it is that so many uh, Jewish journalists and writers are now in Vilnius. He, um, he also plots kind of this, this new spirit of um, solidarity kind of um, that ar arose when they came, when all of them came to, to Vilnius, that they kind of um, put their forces together to, to do something, but he doesn't go into detail basically. <laughs> it's just very ambiguous.
Yep. Yep. Why is there so little documentation of the DP camps? Wow. Uh, well, I guess this is, this is actually connected to what we're doing right now. Um, the DP camps also very much uh, were operative in Yiddish. This is a language that is, hasn't really entered the field of Holocaust studies uh, until today. So this is one of the reasons, I would say, why this has been overlooked. And there has been, of course, in Holocaust studies, there definitely has been a focus on the destruction of Jewish life and not so much an interest of um, Jewish culture in the wake of the Holocaust. So I think there has to be this cultural turn as well. So this will be our last question. Thank you. Uh, as a former citizen of Vilna, I knew many, many, many people, but, and uh, I am now actually completing the preparation for publication of a diary that was written in Vilna uh, by, it came out in 18 languages, including German, Marsha Rolnikaiti, oh, you sure know, Ich muss erzählen, and, uh, the book is interesting because I didn't see the German edition, I, but most of them, because it's two parts, her survival mm -hmm. and the survival of the book itself. Right. Even a larger part, it's more than her diary. Mm -hmm. uh, a side question, are you familiar, and by the way, she worked in the uh, Vilna Library part-time during this, so she was, and there was also a historical effort by a group of uh, Jewish poets who tried to save the books and Stalin saved, sent two aeroplanes. Uh, this was Avram Sutskover group and all that, uh, which by itself a story. Of course, of course, I know this is the paper brigade. Um, many people probably know about them as well. Um, David Fishman from JTS just published a very important book about them. Um, I think um, Sutskeva um, and Kaczyginski were actually already part of, these, uh, of this committee. Um, there's kind of evidence for that that I found that there was definitely a collaboration with, uh, between Prilutsky and Sutskeva and Kaczyginski. So I think it's actually this golden chain that um, that we see here also in Vilnius during this really horrible period where um, Holocaust documentation was kind of, Prilutsky was killed very early on under Nazi, under Nazi occupation already, I believe in the beginning of August 1941. Um, and they kind of took over trying to save as much material as possible. It was a different kind of um, resistance, but I do think the two are connected in some sense. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>